Welcome to the Genealogy Gems Podcast. It's a show filled with family history research strategies and techniques, news and entertainment, and inspiration. And I'm your host, Lisa Louise Cook. Hello and welcome to Genealogy Gems Podcast episode number 239. It's March of 2020, and I'm just back from Roots Tech 2020, uh, held in Salt Lake City. Uh, I taught three different sessions, a couple of them were brand new, and also did a podcasting panel. Of course, I met so many of you at the booth, and I know we have a ton of new premium members, so welcome to everybody. Uh, We just had a brand new premium show published last week. It was just a week behind because of Roots Tech, but I know you guys were so patient and it gave us a chance to welcome uh, hundreds of new premium members. Today in this episode, uh, I think we've got a really fascinating episode for you. There's a brand new book out and it's called The Lost Family, How DNA Testing is Upending Who We Are. This is by Libby Copeland. She's a journalist who who takes a really deep dive into just everything that has kind of exploded in the world of DNA, not just genetic genealogy, but really just DNA testing. That's coming up in this episode. And I think it's really going to be a great extension to a conversation that that you and I had uh, a couple of episodes ago. I think it was back, I say a couple, my gosh, I think it was episode 217, where we talked about the role that DNA was playing in the Golden State Killer case out in California and how criminal investigators were starting to finally, and really I say finally, because I think it was kind of an obvious extension of uh, DNA databases. And they were tapping into it because they've been working with DNA for decades, trying to solve cold cases and current criminal cases. So with Golden State Killer case, they kind of really launched into tapping into the genealogy databases that are already out there with DNA test results. And that has opened really a whole can of worms in many different directions, both in the genealogy community and outside of it. And when I published episode 217, you know, that topic was brand new and it really wasn't getting fully explored. And I felt like it was really important because so many of the ramifications of all of this have an impact on us as genealogists, particularly if we are testing or if we're thinking about testing. And many people are still kind of on the fence about that. So we're going to talk about how DNA has kind of upended who we are and how folks are dealing with it, how the industry is dealing with it, and um, some of the questions that it's posing for us all in the future. Now, I mentioned that we were just at Roots Tech, and that is where I launched my brand new book. It's the Genealogist Google Toolbox, the third edition. And yeah, it really felt like it was time already in 2020 to put out a third edition. I premiered a brand new uh, presentation at Roots Tech this year on the Genealogist Google search methodology for 2020. In working on that, it became clear that the book needed a revision as well. I hope you're going to be as excited about this new edition as I am. Not only are we really digging deeper into kind of what's going on at Google, what does it mean for you when you're analyzing the results that you're getting? And of course, how do we make sure we're still doing the very best search querying possible in order to get the very best results in the fastest amount of time? That's our goal, right? Let's get our results faster and let's get the best quality results possible. Understanding what's going on at Google and what the, and how to interpret the search results page is becoming a bigger and bigger factor. So you'll find the whole front section of the book has been rewritten to kind of address this. Um, also in this book, you're going to find a couple of brand new chapters. And one of them was touching on some, some of my favorite tips and tricks for Google Chrome. I think if I had attempted to do an entire chapter on everything to do with Google Chrome, we would have had a book twice the size. (laughs) So, And so much of it is pretty intuitive. I know you guys know how to use Google Chrome, the web browser, but I do have some great tips and tricks on how to use it more efficiently and how to customize it, really kind of make it your own, uh, particularly for genealogy research. But the other chapter that I just think is a game changer is the one on Google Photos. And many of you have written and you've had questions about Google Photos. 
I've, I've watched webinars on using Google Photos. I've read, you know, blog posts and articles and things. And as an end user myself, I just wasn't feeling it. You know, I just wasn't totally gelling in my mind. I didn't feel like I was really hearing a clear voice on how to use it. And it was really my daughter, Lacey, who said, Mom, you got to do this yourself because, you know, it's a little challenging to get started. And yet I'm using it and I'm loving it. And I can only imagine what you'll do with it for genealogy. So I really, really dug into it over the last several months. And I I feel like I got a really good handle on it. And hopefully you will agree that I've been able to present it to you in a really clear and easy to understand way that just gets to the heart of what it can do for you. You know, Tech tools are are great, but they're not awesome unless they solve a problem. This one solves more problems than I ever imagined. And so that's why I just think this is so exciting. And yes, it's a pretty big chapter because I just felt like there was so much there to offer. Uh, The brand new session that I taught at Roots Tech this year was on solving photo identification cases. I work on lots of different cases, both personally and for you guys, my listeners, and for friends and colleagues. And I've discovered that uh, I've got some techniques that I'm not hearing about in other places. So was really excited to share those with everybody at Roots Tech. We had a huge ballroom. My gosh, there must have been a thousand people in there. It was amazing. Uh, we were all in the same place. We all wanted to get our photos identified. And it was so invigorating for me to be able to share not only the existing techniques that I have, but some of the newest ones that I've been using and real examples of how they play out in incorporating Google Photos into this photo identification strategy. And of course, that's just, again, one thing that Google Photos can do for you. So needless to say, I'm, I'm pretty jazzed about the new book. So of course, that's available at our website, genealogygems.com in the store. And you can look forward in the coming months here on the podcast to tips and tricks from the book, as well as some examples of the ways I'm using it in my own research. I hope that will uh, help and inspire you as well. And of course, if you are a Genealogy Gems premium member, I have such good news for you. First up is that the new search methodology 2020 session that I did at Roots Tech has been recorded And uh, I am awaiting my copy of it so that I can put it on premium membership. So we're going to be updating that video class for you. You're going to have the the brand new handout that's downloadable that goes with it. And you can watch that at your convenience on demand, of course, and work along with me. Why not? And also that brand new photo identification class, that one is in production. It wasn't filmed at Roots Tech, but we are filming it here at the Genealogy Gems offices. So that one is coming to premium membership for you. If you're not a premium member, of course, you can do that again at our website. Um, I think we have a link through the store, but you can also go through the main menu under premium and and learn more and subscribe there. Love sharing uh, new ideas with you. And I love hearing your ideas back and your questions. That's what stimulates, you know, what we're going to talk about next uh, here on the podcast. So with that being said, let's head to the mailbox and hear from you. Well, here in the mailbox, I've got a bit of a googly question here. This one comes from Jen, and she says, I've been doing my genealogy since 1998, but like a lot of folks, work and life has gotten in the way. I really stepped away for about eight years, and then I would start and stop. Well, that that happens for a lot of us. She says, I was finding it difficult to focus and would quickly get frustrated when I tried to spend an hour here and there. I found your podcast back in October-ish. I don't remember exactly how I found you, but I enjoyed the free podcast so much that I became a premium member last November. Oh, welcome, Jen. She says, I've been listening to you every morning and afternoon during my commute to work. I have got to say, you have really inspired me. She says, I have even ordered your new book. It's supposed to arrive today and I can't wait. 
I've been applying several of your tips, such as using the Google search operators, becoming a premium Evernote user, and organizing my computer files. I've been a Roots Magic user since the first version. I picked it up at a conference in Milwaukee, Wisconsin back in the early 2000s, and I've been hooked ever since. You even inspired me to start my own blog. Oh my gosh, this is fantastic. Congratulations. She says, this is something I thought I would never do. But with your helpful tutorials and encouragement, I got started last month and I already have seven posts. Awesome. And she's talking about we have a couple of free quick tutorials on the Genealogy Gems YouTube channel. And we also went into creating your own blog pretty in depth in premium podcast episodes. So those are available as well. She says, my question is about getting my blog to show up in Google search. Yes, that's important. I am using Blogspot, of course, uh, which is a Google product. Blogspot is. Uh, it's free. She says, I've used Google Search Console to request indexing for my URLs, and they are all indexed. I've included labels and pictures. I use the keywords often that I think that folks will search for. Excellent. I'm not sure what I'm doing wrong. Can you help me? So her blog, let me click on the link she gave me here. It's called Poland Family History. Oh, but not necessarily the country of Poland. This is a surname. Talk about a common name surname. On her blog, it says, this blog is about the Poland family surname. My maiden name is Poland, and I've been searching the Poland family line for many years. The Poland family genealogy hit a brick wall with William Poland, in 1788 in Virginia and died in 1856 in Indiana after living and marrying in Ohio for a short time. The intent of this blog is to detail my research journey on the Poland family line and hopefully connect with long lost cousins. Sounds like a great goal for a blog. (laughs) So essentially what I hear Jen saying is that she's created this blog she's done some some important things which not even every blogger knows about which is getting into the Google Search Console, which is a free tool that they have. And you can submit your your blog uh, URL so that they will index it, which just means they go and they, they crawl through it, they make copies of everything, and they will eventually feed that into search results. So Jen's goal would be, oh, I hope, you know, long lost cousins and other researchers working on the William Poland line will be searching and my blog posts will pop up in their search results, thereby bringing them to my site and we can connect. Maybe they would comment, maybe they'd email each other. And that is such a great strategy. It's very effective. But it sounds like from what I can tell and looking at the blog, it started about three or four weeks ago, um, now as I'm recording. And so I gave her a couple of suggestions. Now, one of the things was she told me how she was searching to try to see if her blog post would pop up. So she was using some of my strategies from the book. She's got uh, William in quotes and Poland in quotes, uh, 1788 dot 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 1856. That's a num range search. And one of the things I let her know was that it's technically it's two dots, two periods between two numbers. Four digit numbers, of course, can represent years, right? So she's trying to get search results that focus in on 1788 through 1856. And with genealogy websites, it's very common, obviously, that we would have these years all over the place as we're talking about our family. But I can see in her search that she's putting three periods, it really should be two. That works. Sometimes three works, but technically the official is two dots. She's also got tilde genealogy. Now there's an example of how Google searching changes. Uh, In the new book, I go into this. That's called a synonym search. When we put a tilde, the little squiggly line, and we put it right next to a word. In the past, that would tell Google, okay, search for this word, but also for synonyms of that word. So if, if it's tilde genealogy, she's hoping if they're searching on the terms family history, or family tree, it will still pop up. Here's the thing, Google did away with the tilde. So things change and and it would be frustrating. Obviously, it's frustrating for her if you're still using something that is no longer supported, or maybe it's supported in a different way. Maybe there's a different operator. 
So um, that I definitely talked about in the book. So I would remove that. I would remove the tilde altogether. Google, and again, because of changes in the algorithm, is doing a much better job of understanding context, language, and which words might be critical in terms of synonyms. So you can literally just type in the word genealogy, and that's going to help Google understand that the entire query has something to do with genealogy, not the country of Poland necessarily. It's also going to automatically know we, we probably should keep an eye out and, and include family history, family tree, other synonyms for genealogy when we give people search results. So Jen can remove the tilde, just put the word in genealogy. She subtracted a couple words. She subtracted Polish because William Poland is not Polish. If that makes sense. And she also subtracted some other nationalities that she felt might get in the way because they're actually not applicable to this family line, but it might very well be a popular thing for people to search on. So she's got minus Russian and minus Austrian. So that's great. You can subtract words from your query to get them out of the way, get them out of the search results. They're clogging things up, right? The thing is, as she runs this search, it wasn't quite working. I made modifications to it. And I noticed that also her blog posts are still not really popping up. Here's the thing. It can take Google up to a month or more to fully index your site and also start incorporating those indexed pages into search results. So one of the things I recommend for Jen is to set up Google Analytics and Google Console. Now it sounds like she's using Google Console. Um, analytics will tell you kind of what's driving traffic to your website or your blog. Um, if your society has a blog or a website, you might want to encourage them to set up analytics. If you've got one of your own and you kind of want to know who's finding me and who's not finding me and that kind of thing, analytics will help tell you that. And that's a free tool that Google offers. You can just Google it, Google Analytics and Google Console. I double checked to make sure that her website was indexed. Uh, it had been found by Google. And you can do this too. If you have your own website or family history website or a society website, I typed into the Google search box, site, S-I-T-E, colon, and then I pasted the URL address for the homepage of her blog. So in this case, it was polandfamilyhistory.blogspot.com. And you can do this yourself. I've got this in the show notes for you. And check it out. See what it looks like when this happens. You can actually search for pages on a website to see what Google has found. And you could do this with any website address. I would just use the home address, not, you know, a page deep within the website. So when you run this site colon and the website address, you can see Google found all seven of her posts. So that is great. Now there's lots of people out there who are experts on websites and blogs and, and how to create them and how to really get Google, you know, to find them and all that kind of stuff. Uh, I know a bit about it, but certainly I would recommend that you go to Google and search for those kinds of expert blogs to get more ideas on search engine optimization, Google indexing of blogs, those kinds of terms, because there's a lot of great information out there on the web to help support you to get found. In this case, I would say keep blogging. That's the key. Keep blogging, putting as many keywords, as many dates, all the information that you have onto your blog posts, and then give it a little bit of more time because eventually these things are going to start showing up and you never know what somebody is searching for. And so the more information and content that you add to your family history blog, the more successful you will be and it will show up in search results. So be patient, be consistent, keep blogging and use some of the great free tools that are out there to help beef up your website so it can be found by Google. And thank you so much, Jen, for writing in and congratulations on the brand new blog. And hopefully, uh, if anybody out there listening has a William Poland in their family, they will go check out your blog. All right, well, coming up next, I've got my interview with Libby Copeland on her brand new book, The Lost Family. Let 
Our sponsor for this episode is MyHeritage. They have over 70 million members worldwide. Now, if you're serious about making connections in the country where your ancestors once lived, hands down, MyHeritage is the place that you want to be. I uploaded my family tree hoping for a breakthrough in my German family line, and that breakthrough happened really quickly. I received a message from a distant cousin in Germany, and that was my first international cousin contact. And my heritage has a unique and powerful search system. It's called Record Matches. Now, this constantly calls over 8 billion historical records for your family. It's also the only family history interface out there using semantic analysis to search newspaper articles, books, and other free text documents. So find out what MyHeritage can do to help you grow your family tree. Visit MyHeritage.com. It's free to get started, so there's really no reason to wait. And there are billions of reasons to try it out. Visit MyHeritage.com. Well, as you know, I produce and host the Family Tree Magazine podcast, and it was interesting. The folks who were promoting the book, The Lost Family, got in touch both with me and with Family Tree Magazine. So I ended up doing a a, a kind of a quick 10-minute interview with Libby Copeland for the podcast, which you'll hear in the next episode. I believe it's coming up in the April 2020 episode. And I felt like, you know, we just couldn't do the book really justice. So what I've got for you today is the original Family Tree Magazine interview, the short version, and then an extended interview. So let's get started with my conversation with Libby Copeland, author of The Lost Family. In the new book, The Lost Family, How DNA Testing is Upending Who We Are, award-winning journalist Libby Copeland seeks answers to the question, how much our genes should get to tell us about who we are? And here to talk more about that is the author, Libby Copeland. Hi, Libby. Oh, hey. Thank you so much for having me. I'm thrilled to be here. The book is fascinating. You've covered so many important key areas. So let's talk about some of these. DNA testing, the technology, the marketplace, the genealogy community, the aftershocks of surprise results. These are all huge topics, and they're all in this one topic of DNA testing. Was there a certain event that kind of put this whole situation on your radar and kind of motivated you to really take a very deep dive? Yeah, so this is a fascinating topic. I'm um, a journalist who writes about the intersection of science and culture. So, you know, how do science and technology inform how we see ourselves? How can science help us better understand um, why we do the things we do? Um, And about three years ago, I wrote for the Washington Post a story about a a fascinating genetic mystery that was discovered by a woman named Alice Collins Playbuke, who was an early adopter of autosomal DNA testing. Um, And I followed her story. It took her about two and a half years to solve her mystery. It was one of those very unusual uh, cases where there was a very unusual and surprising explanation for her unexpected DNA results. And in the wake of that piece running in the Washington Post, I got email after email from readers. Um, Readers wanted to tell me about their own DNA testing surprises and the ways that these have played out in profound and intimate ways in their lives. And I was incredibly moved by these emails. I remember they started pouring in and within a few weeks or a month or so, I had over 400. And um, these stories were um, heartbreaking and heartwarming. They were complicated. They were, um, you know, they were still actively processing these stories. And I just thought, gosh, you know, we're really changing the way we think about ourselves and how we relate to one another and how we think about family in all these really profound ways. Um, This really deserves to be a book. And that's how The Lost Family got started. And it it really does. I mean, I won't ask you about Alice's story, because I really think that's what makes your book riveting is the fact that you have a personal story kind of woven throughout. But I would be interested to know, you were in a unique position to directly hear from so many people. What were some of the types of stories or types of scenarios that really surprised you? You didn't expect that or that you just thought were fascinating? 
Yeah, so, um, you know, the most common kind of significant unexpected result, you know, is an NPE, um, which is usually known as a non-paternity event, or more recently people have begun referring to it as not parent expected, and so it's, you know, you discover one or both parents isn't genetically related to you. Um, those stories were incredibly common, and um, and yet each, of course, totally distinct. Um, so, you know, I tell in my book the story of a of a man um, in his uh, 30s who didn't know his father. His mother eventually told him the identity of his father, and he went on to get to know the man over the next 12 years. They would go golfing once or twice a year, um, and they were trying to form this relationship. It was kind of an arm's-length awkward thing. And finally, um, he goes and he does DNA testing, and it turns out this man who he's been trying to form this relationship with for 12 years is not his genetic father. And, um, you know, the ways that it plays out, it's incredibly complicated for him. It's complicated for the man who thought he was his father, um, and he winds up discovering the man who is. So that's one of those you know, twists and turns stories. There's a number of stories in there about NPEs and about how the people who are seeking their genetic fathers uh, or seeking the identity of their genetic fathers, um, how they deal with that information and how the men on the other side deal with that information. Um, there's also, obviously, there's a lot of um, adoptees who've used autosomal DNA testing to discover their birth families um, and that really, you know, that they and the search angels who helped them have pioneered the techniques, the genetic genealogy techniques that, you know, that so many people now use in their searches. Um, and I also tell the story of a woman who didn't know she was adopted until she did DNA testing. Um, so there's a number of different ways that can play out. There's also people who are donor-conceived um, who may discover the identity of their genetic fathers. They may also discover that they have siblings, sometimes just a few, sometimes quite a number of siblings. There's um, been many stories about this in the press. I tell the story of a woman who discovers she has um, t 22 siblings and uh, how she forges relationships with um, with those half-siblings and with her uh, genetic father and sort of the delicacy and... Uh, the care and the emotional nuance that they all bring to these relationships. I, I found that story incredibly moving. And you're really talking about people who have absolutely no other connection with them, except for they discovered they have this genetic connection. Why yeah. do you think, or what? just what were your impressions as you talk to so many people? What really drives people on an emotional level to make so much effort with somebody who was literally just another sperm donation a year or two before, a year or two after, and otherwise there was no connection. What's what's really inside each person that uh, makes this so compelling? Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting and complex question, and it's ultimately a question each person decides for themselves, right? Mm -hmm. How how much does genetics get to inform who I am and my sense of family? How much does this man mean to me? Is he, is he my father? Is the man who raised me my father? Um, that The answer to that question will often depend on your relationship with the man who raised you, uh, as well as many other things, um, you know, and, you know, what, what I've found is that the way that people think about family is not a binary, you know, not a binary equation. They don't think, well, genetics is all and, um, you know, and everything else is meaningless or experience and the person who raised me is everything and genetics is nothing. Um, genetics is a lot and also it's not everything. Right. Um, and, and, you know, people are drawn to know more about their, um, where they come from. I mean, it, it, as I put it in the book, it's hard to tell your story if you don't have a beginning. And as, uh, as tester after tester told me, you know, even when the results were unexpected in a way that really rocked their world, ultimately they were they were very glad to know the truth about their genetic identities. It made things make sense. It answered questions they'd long had. It allowed them to go back and rethink their childhoods in a new way. Um, and so all those reasons are part of why I think that, you know, America in many ways, because of commercial DNA testing, is becoming a nation of seekers. And we're all seeking out sort of our origins. Um, and yet, I would say for the most part, we're doing it in a thoughtful way. Um, you know, we're not necessarily saying our genetic origins are everything. Exactly. Now, there's a whole other area to the book, which is the whole scientific side of things and the paths that people have had to navigate in terms of the companies involved and all that. Yeah. Um, did you have a science background? How was this? And because uh, I love the fact that you've really bring the reader through all this 
And even if you're a complete novice at it, what was your experience yeah. on the science side? <laughs> I'm not a scientist. Good Lord, am I not a scientist. <laughs> um, and I learned that, you know, I mean, I knew it going in and I really learned it. Um, you know, it was definitely challenging. Uh, mm-hmm. it, there's a big gulf between writing about science and, and really knowing it and having studied it. So what I did was I, I, had, um, I had a geneticist read the book. Um, I had a genetic counselor spot read sections of the book. When I had descriptions of certain scientific things that came to me from the DNA testing companies or, um, or other um, companies or other entities, I would go back to them and I would say, listen, you know, this is what you told me when I toured your lab or this is what I saw. This is how you described, uh, you know, genetic disease. Um, here's how I've put it in a layperson's terms. Does this capture it or have I missed something in trying to translate this to a general audience? And I sweated the details quite a bit. <laughs> um, I'm sure there's probably some, uh, you know, place in there where I um, you know, didn't quite represent every, you know, it, the way that it, scientists might say it. But I hope I've managed to capture it as faithfully as I could for an audience that you know isn't expected to come in with a PhD. Yeah, exactly. And there are a lot of folks with no background at all, you know, working with their matches and trying to do the segments and the whole nine yards. Absolutely. And pioneering things. I mean, you know, citizen scientists have really led the way in terms of so many ways in which we now use DNA testing in our own lives. It's, It's absolutely amazing. Stay tuned because coming up right after this is my extended interview with Libby Copeland folks are always stopping me and asking for my advice on organizing and securing their family history research. And my standard answer is plant your family tree in your own backyard and share branches online. Planting your tree in your own backyard, it means keeping one master family tree in a software file right there on your own computer. That gives you ownership, control of privacy and security, and one central place to organize everything that you learn about your family. And of course, my software of choice and the one that I use is Roots Magic. I find that its tree building tools are second to none. And with Roots Magic web hints, you can see what record hints are available on Family Search, Find My Past, and My Heritage. And now you have the ability to synchronize your Roots Magic database with your ancestry tree and get those ancestry.com web hints right there inside of Roots Magic. These are features that are really critical and they're exclusive to Roots Magic. So plant your tree today in Roots Magic and watch it grow. Get started at rootsmagic.com. Welcome back to the show, Libby. Oh, Lisa, thank you so much. I love your podcast, and I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you so much. You know, we were talking, and you said you had heard episode 217, where I was talking yes. about the, the Golden State Killer and, and kind of finally opening Pandora's box on this subject. What were your thoughts on that? And I, I have a feeling we have some synergy in this area. Yeah, absolutely. I love that podcast. And I still remember where I was standing when I heard it. And I thought, oh, man, you know, this is so comprehensive. This is so thoughtful. Um, I I was thrilled to hear that that episode. Yeah, I mean, I think this is a really complex area. um, And, you know, it's important that we we think about privacy issues and law enforcement use of DNA, you know, really carefully and, and, uh, you know, with some nuance. I've been following uh, how this has really exploded as a technique for solving cold cases over the last, it's almost two years now, and it's really been transforming, you know, how law enforcement operates. It's quite astonishing to to watch. And the fact that people who just consider themselves to be hobbyists in the area of genealogy, you know, just thought, okay, I'll do this. This will be another kind of tool in my tool chest. But we learned very quickly that just because it's a genealogy website doesn't mean those are the only people who will be interested in this information. Is that right? And was that a surprise to you to talk to people and maybe they didn't necessarily realize that? Yeah, I know. I talked to a number of people right after the Golden State Killer case was solved. And, you know, it was really interesting how, how quickly people reacted to it. There were really strong reactions and they Mm -hmm. often went both ways. So I talked to a number of people who pulled their kits right away. You know, they might have had five or 10 kids up on GEDmatch. They pulled them right away. 
And, um, you know, and I talked to people who were like, yes, this is exactly how it should be used. You know, and there were a lot of people who felt like, you know, maybe this is how it should be used, but informed consent is so incredibly important and guidelines and guardrails are so incredibly important. And, you know, I talked to a bioethicist about that and, and ex- explore that in the book a bit. You know, if this, if, you know, we as a society decide that this is a good use, what kind of guidelines do we set up to make sure that we're only using this for the kinds of cases that we believe are appropriate? And how do we, how do we arrive at a decision about that? And, I, you, you know, you see the beginnings of that with, you know, the, the DOJ guidance that came out in the fall, the Department of Justice for, mm-hmm. for federal cases. But, you know, there's still quite a ways to go, particularly because, um, obviously, states are using this and they may have different criteria for use. So this is in really uncharted territories. Uh, it's 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 amazing to watch how quickly this area has moved. Well, and you're talking about the the criminal justice. I was doing some research in preparation for the episode that you were talking about 217, and uh, I was fascinated to see on an international level that they had already gone beyond that. It was it was they were already into the area of insurance companies, and that yeah. you know, once you have the genetic markers for somebody rebuilding their tree, find out how people died in their family, what diseases were running through their family is not difficult. Did you look into this goes well beyond the United States? Did you learn anything about what's happening on a on a worldwide scope on this? Yeah, you know, a little bit. I mean, I did I did look at it it does seem like there are more regulations and protections generally uh when you look at Europe than here in the United States. You know, in the U.S., we have this federal regulation, GINA, Mm -hmm. um, which is to, you know, protect against genetic discrimination, but it's not comprehensive. It's far from it. And only some states have introduced laws that would sort of uh, account for those loopholes. So, you know, I think the issue is that we, we sort of don't know how this genetic information will be used in the future. We don't know exactly who will have access to it or, um, you know, who we will be sort of like need to reveal it to, um, you know, so we're, we're sort of operating in the dark in a way. It's like we have a flashlight and it only illuminates what's directly in front of us. Yeah, um, that's and a great we, analogy. You know, we have, yeah, we have all this information that's available that we've put up there with the intention for it to be used for one thing. And we cannot anticipate the ways in which it might be used in coming years. We're already seeing with law enforcement, uh, you know, how it can be used for a strikingly different purpose, which could be okay with you or not, depending on people's views on this really vary. But the point is that you can see how information you give, you, you know, you sort of put into a database for one purpose can be used for something else. And it's hard to make a decision about testing uh, when you just don't know what's coming 10 or 20 years down the line. Right. Now, as I was reading the book, there was a gentleman, his last name was Ehrlich. So he, yeah. he had some fascinating comments. And the one I thought was brilliant was when you know you say, well, what's coming in the future? And he says, oh, essentially, he says, I don't have a crystal ball, but you don't need one. You look to the past, which is what right. we as genealogists do all the time. And, right. you know, the whole um, progressive movement at the early 20th century and eugenics and all that, I mean, yeah. all the way into you get into the Holocaust, there's evidence there and information about how people look at the makeup of people. Talk a little bit about that, because, gosh, you learned an awful lot about that whole era. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, the early history of genetics is sort of like a cautionary through line that I follow through the book, because we are certainly not ever that far away from that. I mean, Mm -hmm. it it follows us to this day. You know, if you look at the beginnings of genetics, how intertwined it was with eugenics, and as you say, how progressive reformers used eugenics in what they felt was an attempt to make the world better. (laughs) And that led to forced sterilizations. It led to anti-immigration acts. It led to all sorts of um, really, really horrible things. Um, And, you know, the the sort of scientific racist thinking, uh, you see it today, some people, you know, doing DNA testing to supposedly prove how pure their lineages are, you know, which is admittedly a very fringe use um, mm-hmm, and right. hopefully never none of us will ever stumble across you know that world because it's ugh, you know it's best kept in a corner when we start talking about you know what we're made of and where we come from 
it's incredibly important to be cautious, not only about the limitations of ethnicity estimates, which I talk about in the book, you know, they're, they're definitely an evolving science, but also about what we think about what that means. You know, it, it, there's a sociologist out of the University of Pennsylvania who's been looking at um, how DNA testing affects how we think about race and, and ethnic differences. Um, and what she's found, which is fascinating, is that it, for those who go in with high genetic literacy, in other words, they really kind of grasp the essentials of what's happening when they're spitting into a vial or swabbing their cheek. But for those people, it tends to reduce their genetic essentialism, which is to say that they think of us as more co- having more commonalities rather than fewer. They right. think of, like, the, the commonality of humanity, how we're all alike. But for those who go in with low genetic literacy, it appears that the opposite happens. Hmm. So they may tend to think more in terms of like silos, like, you know, racial and ethnic silos, like you versus that person and how many differences we have. So that's like a really interesting fact. That paper recently came out. And what it tells us is that it's incredibly important to frame how we think about DNA testing, that we have to go in with some knowledge about exactly what it can tell us and what it can't. And we have to go in also thinking like genealogists with a long view of the history, you know, right. how, how genetics has been used and how it can be misused. And I think most importantly that sometimes if you go in with an assumption, so you think you're thinking like a scientist, but really you're going in with loaded assumptions, you're going to find what you want to find. So it's incredibly important to know that culture can inform science. And when culture informs science, sometimes... Uh, you know, the science doesn't stand up, and sometimes that can lead to really bad things. And you know what you're describing, Libby, is just so essential throughout all of genealogy. You can do this with any kind of record if you don't understand yeah. why they created it, what it's about. <laughs> you know, you can draw um, incorrect conclusions. And context DNA, matters. Yes, exactly. DNA yes. certainly falls into that. Yes. It really matters. Well, let's talk about the genealogy community, because you certainly talk to folks throughout the community. I certainly knew lots of the names uh, that you mentioned. And you talked about uh, quite a bit your experience in visiting the Family History Library and, of course, the role that genealogy plays in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Mm -hmm. But, of course, the genealogy community goes well beyond that. (laughs) There are so Mm -hmm. many people. Absolutely. Um, what were your impressions of the community and the culture? And I know that you went to Roots Tech 2019. Was that just a, a brand new experience for you? Oh, you know, I, I did not go to Roots Tech 2019. Oh, I, I wish I had been there. No, I did go to a New York State genealogical conference. Ah. Yeah, in 2018. But yeah, I mean, oh gosh, I would love to go to Roots Tech. And I <laughs> wish I could have gone this year, but I wasn't able to make it. But yeah, I would say that uh, this was one of the most fascinating parts of the book to me, was talking to genealogists about all the ways in which they had, you know, really made, uh, sort of formed the backbone of, of modern genealogy, become part of the citizen science movement that had developed genetic genealogy techniques that we're all using today. There were so many conversations I had with, with genetic genealogists and with genealogists where I just wanted to crawl inside their amazing brains and hang out there. Um, There's a part of the book where there's a genealogist named Roberta Estes who's been doing genealogy since the 1970s, and she talks about what it's like when you're researching with a bunch of collaborators and you go down a rabbit hole, and she calls it seeing a squirrel. Mm -hmm. And she says, you know, we'll be researching, and, you know, it's in the evening, and then all of a sudden you look up and it's 3 a.m., And you're like, what happened? Oh, we saw a squirrel. (laughs) And I love that. Like, I loved, like, the obsessiveness and the tirelessness and the faithfulness to the facts, you know, like, because genealogists are so knowledgeable. I I mean, I, I, I'm just blown away by, by how much history they know and how much, how much granular history they have to know in order to tease apart, you know, these information from the records that can be quite bare bones. So this was, one of the most <laughs> joyous reporting processes was talking to genealogists about things that they'd found in their own in their own histories, about in some cases their work as search angels helping other people, right. and just about like the early days of genealogy and how it how it dovetails with the early days of genetic testing. Yeah, and it's um, such a renaissance. I mean, so many of us, I know I got into it in the 70s when Roots came out and I was a kid. And, you know, and now it's just booming more than ever. And 
these are it's certainly a group of people who don't hesitate. Oh, my gosh, you put another tool in front of them or another record and, and we're all about it. And and I think that's so true. In my talking with just people everywhere, um, you get people who are hot or cold. They're either obsessed or they couldn't care less about genealogy mm-hmm. or DNA. Um, mm-hmm. Did you find people as you were just talking, you must have been talking to family members and friends as you're working on the project where there's some people who are just like, who cares? Oh, totally, because it's so daunting. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, like we were just talking about the need for context, right? If you find a document from 1935 and you are a beginning genealogist and you don't have context for that document from 1935, you know, what do you do with it? Mm-hmm. I went to the Family History Library and I'm not a genealogist. I'm a journalist who was writing about genealogy and I like such a beginner. Uh, And anyway, I went to the Family History Library and I had some lovely volunteers who helped me. I mean, it was incredible. And I found so much in that one afternoon, I was just blown away. But after I left, I realized there was probably so much more if only I'd known where to look. And of course, I don't know where to look. (laughs) You know, it's like, it's, it's, it's again, like that flashlight analogy, you know, you, you can only see what's directly in front of you. And I didn't have the knowledge to know all that I could take advantage of. So I think that some people do find genealogy, you know, kind of overwhelming. There's so much information out there that's available, much of it for free. And, you know, you can kind of like throw up your hands and say, wow, where do I go with this? Right. There's there's a lot of BSOs. I call them BSOs, bright, shiny objects, just like the squirrels, (laughs) you know, and and they can take you in so many different directions. It, It can be like you say, almost daunting to get involved. And yet this is the most exciting time to be involved in it. It really is. It's really amazing. Now, shifting gears, we talked about the the community and and the folks that you spoke to in preparation for this book, The Lost Family. You also spoke to a lot of companies and a lot of DNA testing companies. And of course, in the last year or so, we've been seeing a downturn in uh, Mm -hmm. the DNA market. Ancestry, 23andMe, they're laying off employees. I know that privacy probably played a big role in that because it was you talked about there's such a debate around privacy. I also think there's somewhat of a those who were passionate about possibly testing have kind of done it. Yeah, right now, I think it's both. Yeah, Yeah. it's both. So uh, tell us a little bit about what you found in the industry and what you think the cause of the downturn is. And if you heard any murmurings about, you know, how they're going to kind of recover from that. Right. So, yeah, I do think it, that you've articulated the two main issues. You know, Anne Wojcicki, who's the co-founder of 23andMe, talks a lot about privacy. And she's, in a number of interviews, attributed um, privacy concerns to part of the reason why, you know, the sales of the spit kits have been, have been lessening. Um, but I also think, you know, as you say, the people who were interested and willing to plunk down, say, $100, um, for one of these tests, you know, that group has really, those, those early adopters have really done it already. And some of them have tested it for companies, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> the really committed ones, you know, but, but they've sort of like captured all the low hanging fruit at this point. And so, you know, what you're really seeing from companies, um, including Ancestry and MyHeritage is a pivot, you know, to um, other kinds of products and specifically health products and traits testing and things like that. Um, So I think what they're trying to do is, you know, find a new audience, um, people who might be interested in ancestry, but maybe, you know, maybe they're not willing to put down the money for it quite yet, but they might be mildly interested and they can, they want to be able to offer them something more in addition um, to get them to invest in that. Yeah. And I think also the area of tools. And I know that GEDmatch was one of the early tools Mm -hmm. that people used. And there's Lazarus and there's other things. Um, Talk a little bit about your experience with GEDmatch, because it's changed so much. And family trained DNA as well. We've had Bennett Greenspan here on the show. Um, Yeah. What kind of pivots did you find that they were making while you were writing the book? Yeah, I mean, Curtis Rogers is really um, a fascinating person, because, you know, he he sort of founded his company for one purpose and, um, you know, found that it, GEDmatch was being used for this other reason. And from what I understand, ultimately came around to feeling that that was the right thing so long as people were informed and they had opted in. Um, but he really was operating 
you know, on his own in many ways, it seems mm-hmm. to me, um, trying to make these decisions. And again, this is an area where, like, because it's such uncharted territory and there's no formal guidance and there's no formal rules, really, <laughs> like, he had to make these decisions on his own. Like, should he permit, uh, you know, his database to be used for this use, which didn't fall into this one category? We, you know, it wasn't actually a homicide or a sexual assault, that case out in Utah. I mean, those are really tricky problems. And, um you know, I say that in the book that when it comes to matters of family, like we're all are kind of like lonely bioethicists because when DNA, DNA testing, you know, reveals that your father is not genetically related to you and this other man is, you have to figure out what to do with that information. Well, Curtis Rogers is really had to be a bioethicist too. And he had to make those decisions on behalf of of all these people in his database and, you know, people who had opted in eventually. And so, I, you know, I just think that that's a really fascinating story. He is himself probably a book. Um, you know, the, yeah. the way that, that he had to struggle to come up with, you know, make these decisions, it, it's, it, it's a fascinating story, and it's, it's also indicative of sort of like the territory w- that we're in where it's like one person, or in the case of Bennett Greenspan, like one person, basically, um, you know, with colleagues making a decision on behalf of all these people who've entrusted their genetic information to you. Right. And, it's, and it's they did wild. And they couldn't yeah. have predicted that they would even be no. in that position. There's yeah. so many things we couldn't predict. I mean, we couldn't predict that fertility banks couldn't have predicted that the promises of anonymity that they were giving to sperm donors would be rendered moot. You know, right. like right. There's, there's, there's so many ways in which DNA is sort of like taking all our assumptions and tossing them out the window. Um, that's just one more example. So maybe that's what you mean by the fact that society has been irrevocably changed by DNA testing. That's, yeah, there's just, yeah, once the cat's out, you don't put them back in the bag, right? Right, right. And like, you know, I'll say in many, many cases, people have told me like, knowing my genetic identity, my truth Mm -hmm. has helped me like, even when it's disruptive, even when it's unexpected, even when it's, it's painful in some ways, I'm glad to know. So it's not a question of, really, is this a good thing or is this a bad thing? It's, is this a big thing? And the answer is yes, this is a big thing. The, the, the DNA is revealing things in many cases that people wish had never been secrets in the first place. So in some ways, it may be kind of like acting as a leveler, right? Like now we all have more transparency. Now we can have these difficult conversations. Maybe it's kind of resetting things in some ways for some families. But the point is that it is absolutely changing us. It's changing the way we talk to each other. It's changing even what we expect the past to be able to tell us, like how much the past owes us in a way. And I mean that both from the perspective of people who do genealogy and also in, in the law enforcement you know, angle, like it's changing our expectations about what, uh, you know, a, a, an old uh, article of clothing with some DNA on it from the 1970s, like mm-hmm. how much that can tell us about now and maybe a serial killer who's out there right now still operating. So DNA is really like, it's really causing in many ways like the past to collide with the present. And that's what I find so fascinating is this, how this technology is, is, is changing the way we operate and changing our relationship to the past and to truth. Right. Well, I don't want to say truth is changing, but that the truth of the woman in 1950 who made a decision, yes. and the context yes. of her environment, that is almost something we can't understand. If you no, weren't the there in her shoes, how would yes. we possibly understand? So it's such a delicate time of, as with all genealogy, I guess, yes. we have to remember the place, the time that that uh, they may be smiling in the picture, but that doesn't mean everybody's right. happy. <laughs> right, and, right. No, I was going to say, I mean, that's, that's the flip side, right? So there, there are people who do the testing and they say, like, oh, I'm so glad to know my genetic identity. And they're very often the ones who are finding out fundamental things about their birth, mm-hmm. right? But then there's also uh, the person who, you know, who kept that genetic secret at perhaps in some cases a matter of survival. Yes. Or, you know, their whole identity is premised on people not knowing this thing about them because, you know, they were forced to give up their child in a maternity home. Mm-hmm. 60 years ago, you know, and that, that is, that is a traumatic experience. And I mean, that's part of why I think there needs to be more mental health resources for people on yes. every side of this, of this kind of 
change in our society because like these these excavations of the past they can be wonderful they can be painful they can be both at the same time and they happen all at once very suddenly and sometimes you're not in control of whether they happen right you're not the agent in your own story it the, the truth is coming to you and um, so, I mean, I think people really need support to process these. And, and as of yet, there's, there's a lot of support in Facebook groups, but there's not, really, there's not really much in the way of formal support for people who are going through these experiences. And I really think that's what's needed. I imagine the mental health industry is also rushing to catch up uh, because, yeah. uh, you know, I've heard from people who emailed me and I, I love the heartwarming stories of the connections that people make and the fact that they don't feel alone anymore. I mean, these are just amazing. And yet I've heard from people who said, it's really hard to be in the echo chamber of Facebook and see all these stories mm. and know mine isn't like that. And yeah. now I feel even worse that somehow there's something wrong yeah. with me and my family that we're not having this happy reunion. And, and everybody's just trying to catch up. And I, I hope if nothing yeah. else, we all get a big dose of compassion for each other. We're all in it together, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, there was a therapist I talked to for the book who said, you know, um, and she had discovered that um, she had an NPE. So her father, oh. uh, the man she thought of as her father wasn't genetically related to her. And she was instead genetically related to somebody else. And she was saying, you know, what I see in the press are these happy reunion stories. I see these one-off stories and they don't really reveal how complicated this is. And she sort of walked me through the emotional landscape of her response to this experience, which she was able to do with incredible precision because she is a therapist. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and she, she, she and others told me how these revelations play out. They don't kind of resolve themselves after months. It's not like you go and you meet your genetic kin and then like you hug and then you're down, you're down with everything and everything's cool and you're done. Right. It's like a processing that happens, I think in many cases for years, it may go on for a lifetime. Like we don't know, the research isn't out yet, but I talked to people who had their revelations like five or more years ago and they were still processing the news and making sense of it. You know, so, Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, these are things that um, they're not uncomplicated. That's that's the important thing. And what I wanted to capture, what I what I wanted to capture was the voices of the people telling me, here's the complexity of my experience. You know, even though I had a happy reunion, here's where I still feel lost or here's where I feel lost because the people that I expected to embrace me have not embraced me. And I feel bad because everyone else has their happy story and I don't. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's why I think this book, The Lost Family, is such a breath of fresh air. You have done such an amazing job of kind of, in a sense, touching on all the different angles and stories. Everybody can read this and say, I can see myself in this part and I can see the bigger picture and put it into a bigger context and maybe have a little sympathy for everybody involved as we all try to figure it all out. I have to ask you, because you talked about yeah. that um, society's been changed. So my final question to you would be, how did writing the book change you? Yeah, thank you for asking me that. Um, I, you know, I, I have to say, I, I cried. <laughs> I cried mm-hmm. writing this book when I was interviewing people because their stories were so moving to me. And I... I just felt that, you know, it was important to kind of like normalize this experience. So I do hope that people see themselves in the book because I want them to feel represented and that there's like a range of, there's no like one right outcome of how this goes for people, right? right like right. You, you can, you can expect that it could go many different ways and you should feel that someone else has been there, has been there with you. Um, I think you know what i what i was really left with was the generosity and the love of these stories like the the theme that came up over and over again which was that we are all seekers in a sense we're all seeking love and acceptance and validation and we all define family broadly i mean that that was the other thing i found was that like people were not like oh genetics is all experience intention love all those things matter um, and so at the end of writing the book, I felt really quite hopeful about our ability to have compassion for each other and to see all sides and to be kind of big hearted in our definition of, of family. And so, you know, I feel like we're at the beginning of something that could be, um, you know, something that could be a good thing if we can talk about, if we can talk about 
how it affects all of us, and we can kind of normalize the experience. I think we can make this experience, um, you know, better for people. Well, I appreciate you generating more of that conversation in the book and certainly coming here and having conversation with me. It's been such a pleasure talking with you, Libby. Oh, thank, thank you, you so much. much. I'm, I'm so thrilled to be here. It's such a treat. Well, if, as you discover more and learn more, and when you write the second book, you promise to come back, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Libby. <laughs> Thanks. As you can hear, Libby is passionate about the work and the research that she's been doing on DNA and how it's changing our world. If you'd like to pick up a copy of her book, please do head to the show notes for this episode. It's episode number 239. And we have a link there. Um, When you use our links, you're helping to support this free podcast. And it makes it completely possible for us to track down and bring authors like Libby Copeland to you here on the show. It doesn't cost you a thing to use our link. But when you do click it, it will take you over to Amazon. And by doing that, it lets Amazon know we sent you. And so they give us a little bit of compensation for that, which again goes straight back into producing this show for you. So thank you so much for using our Amazon links. Anytime you do any shopping, Christmas, birthdays, whatever you're doing, I shop at Amazon a lot. You can go to our homepage as well, genealogygems.com. And at the bottom of the page, you can click the Amazon icon and then do your shopping. And you're still helping bring genealogy to your ears. Again, thank you so much to Libby Copeland. And you'll find highlights and uh, details about the conversation that you just heard in the show notes. On our website, go to podcast and click on Genealogy Gems podcast. Click on episode 239. That'll take you right there. And if you're listening through the app, there's a link for you for the show notes there as well. Have you visited backblaze.com slash Lisa yet? If you don't have cloud backup for your computer yet, everything on it is vulnerable to loss. Your pictures, your master genealogy database, files for work, the everyday business of your household, losing all that at once is as devastating as it sounds. That's why I did my homework and I found a cloud-based backup service provider. I chose Backblaze. It runs in the background 24-7 automatically saving copies of everything, including my precious video files. Did you know that some of the other leading services actually skip your video files when they do the backup? Hello, not good. And Backblaze is so easy to use. I love their free app that allows me to access all my files if I need to from my smartphone or my tablet. Most importantly, the service is totally affordable for real people. It's just $5 a month. So don't wait to ensure that all your files are safe. Do it now. Back them up like I do with Backblaze. Head over to backblaze.com slash Lisa and get that $5 a month deal. Check it out for yourself. You could even do a free trial. That's backblaze.com slash Lisa. Well, we've come to the end of another genealogy podcast episode together. Episode 239. I hope you had as much fun as I did. I love chatting with you. I I really appreciate the fact that you put me on your playlist and you share your day with me. I love sharing with you everything that's going on in the world of genealogy. Uh, If you want to share with me what you've been doing, what your questions are, what you'd like to hear on the show, email me at genealogygemspodcast at gmail.com or leave a voicemail on the voicemail line, 925-272-4021. And with that, I am finishing up my podcasting day because tomorrow I am headed over to my daughter Vienna's house and uh, to play with the grandkids, Davey and Joey and little Emily. I understand that daddy built a brand new playhouse this last weekend. (laughs) So I believe there's tea and crumpets waiting for Shasha tomorrow at Emily's little house. So I cannot wait. Thank you so much for listening, friend. I'll talk to you soon.